Hi, welcome to What's a Chi-Squared Fit? In this video, we're going to talk about doing a chi-squared fit. We're just going to cover the basic idea of what a chi-squared fit is and go through a simple scenario where one might use a chi-squared fit. Mathematical details and more technical considerations will be left to other videos. Now, this video assumes that you're already familiar with a couple of topics. The first of those is the chi-squared distribution. If you're not familiar with that, you might want to check out the video Introduction to the Chi-Squared Distribution. This video also assumes that you're familiar with Gaussian errors. If you're not, you might want to check out the videos in the Gaussian Statistics playlist. Okay, so let's set up a simple scenario. Let's say we're on some alien planet that has no atmosphere. We want to measure the local acceleration due to gravity on that planet's surface. Let's call that acceleration g. And you might remember that on Earth, g is equal to 9.8 meters per second squared. To measure g on this planet, we're going to drop a ball off of a cliff. We will let it go from rest at time t equals 0. We will then measure how far the ball has dropped at time t equals 1 second. And at time t equals 2 seconds, and at t equals 3 seconds, etc. So let's call the distance that the ball has dropped y of t. So the farther the ball has dropped, the larger y is. If we release the ball from y equals 0 at t equals 0 with no initial velocity, then y of t will take the following form y of t is equal to 1 half g t squared. By measuring y of t at many times t, we hope to obtain g. Now we should note that if we want to include the possibility the ball was released from initial location y naught not equal to 0 with initial downward velocity v naught not equal to 0, we could write the more complicated expression y of t is equal to y naught plus v naught t plus 1 half g t squared. And then we could measure y of t at many points to obtain y naught, v naught, and g. But here, for simplicity, let's do the, well, simple case. We're going to assume that y naught and v naught are known to be very close to zero with high precision. So we're going to use the function y of t equals one half g t squared. We're also going to assume that we can control the timing of our measurements at t equals one second, t equals two seconds, etc., very precisely. So we know very precisely when our measurements of y of t occurred. Okay, so for example, if g were to equal 2 meters per second squared, the function y of t would look like this. Now, if we measure the positions y of t, our measurements will have some uncertainty. And this means that the data points will not fall exactly on this curve. So here's an example set of data points that we might acquire in the case that g is equal to 2 meters per second squared. We are taking our errors to be Gaussian distributed and uncorrelated between the data points. And it's important to note that the error bars on the different points can be different sizes. 
Alternatively, here we show a similar plot of the function y of t for the case where g is equal to 3 meters per second squared. And here is a possible set of measured values which we could acquire if we were to measure y of t under that scenario. Okay, so, so far we've seen what measured values of y of t might look like for a couple different values of g. So we looked at the cases where g is equal to 2 meters per second squared and g is equal to 3 meters per second squared. But unfortunately, in our scenario, we don't know what g is. What we do know are the measured values of y of t and their error bars. Here we show those data points with the curves for g equals 2 meters per second squared and g equals 3 meters per second squared superimposed. By eye, it looks like g is probably somewhere between 2 and 3 meters per second squared. But how do we extract a value for g from this data? That brings us to the idea of a chi-squared fit. Okay, so let's say we have a bunch of independent measurements whose errors are Gaussian distributed. In our scenario, these are the measurements of y of t. Also, we believe that the true values of these measured quantities are related by some function whose form we know. So in our scenario, we believe that y of t is of the form 1 half gt squared. And that function has a parameter or parameters that we don't know but want to determine. In our scenario, we want to determine the value of g. Okay, so in doing a chi-squared fit, we ask the following question. For a given value of g, how probable is the set of experimental values that we actually obtained? Okay, so we took as an assumption that the measurement errors were Gaussian distributed. This implies that the measured values will be Gaussian distributed around the true values. Now we have several data points. Let's index them by the letter i. So the first measurement corresponds to i equals 1, the second one i equals 2, etc. And let's take a look at the ith measurement. Okay, so let's define some notation. We'll call the measured value of y, y measured, and we'll index it with the subscript i. So y i measured is the ith measured value of y, taken at time ti. Sigma i will be the uncertainty on the ith measurement. With that, we're ready to give the probability density for y i measured. Because we assume that our errors are Gaussian distributed, y i measured will be Gaussian distributed around 1 half g t i squared. The probability density for y i measured is shown here. If you want more information on where this expression comes from, you might want to check out the videos on Gaussian errors referenced at the beginning of the video. Okay, so we have several measurements of y at different times. The measurements are independent. This means to get the joint probability density for the whole set of measurements, we just multiply the probability densities for the individual measurements together. That product is shown here by the large pi symbol. Okay, so let's say we want to choose the value of g, which maximizes the probability of the set of observed results. This means choosing the value of g, which maximizes what we have in the exponent. Remember that the product of a bunch of exponentials is the exponential of the sum of their arguments. So this means we want to choose the value of g, 
which maximizes this sum shown at the bottom of the page. Okay, here we have that sum from the previous page that we want to maximize. It has a factor of minus one half in it. Maximizing this sum is the same as minimizing that same sum with the minus one half removed. So let's do that. So now we want to minimize the sum shown at the bottom of this slide. Okay, so let's call that quantity chi-squared. So what we want to do is choose the value of g which minimizes the value of chi-squared. So this is chi-squared minimization. Basically we choose the values of the parameters which minimize chi-squared. And for those viewers who have had calculus, what you do is the following. You differentiate with respect to the parameters and then you set those derivatives to zero. And then you solve the resulting equations. Okay, so let's take a look at that function that we're minimizing. Our chi-squared is a sum of a set of fractions. And in each one of those fractions we have a numerator and a denominator. In the numerator we have the square of the difference between the measured value and the value predicted for that particular value of g. In the denominator, we have the square of the uncertainty for a given data point. So in order to minimize chi-squared, we want to get, for each data point, one-half gt squared very close to the measured value of y. Furthermore, for each data point, the smaller that sigma is, the more important that it is that one-half gt squared be very close to y measured. Before, we compared these data points with curves where g is equal to 2 meters per second squared and g is equal to 3 meters per second squared. By eye, it looks like the result for g would land somewhere in between those two values. But let's take a look at that last data point with the large error bar. If the error bar on that last point were much smaller, but the measured value itself was unchanged, this would pull the result for g toward g equals 2 meters per second squared. And if that were the case, the g equals 3 meters per second squared curve would be strongly disfavored. Alternatively, we can also take a look at that next to last data point. If the error bar on this data point were reduced, again without changing the measured value, that would drag g toward g equals 3 meters per second squared. Okay, so now let's give a brief discussion of what we've seen. In doing a chi-squared fit, we choose the values of the fit parameters, which would maximize the likelihood of the observed results. This is an example of what is called maximum likelihood estimation. In our scenario, we would choose the value of g, which maximizes the likelihood of the observed values y, i measured. Now it's important to know that this does not mean that we have determined the most likely value of g. Finding the most likely value for g would involve applying Bayes' theorem and assuming a prior probability distribution for g. We're not going to do that here, but if you're interested, you can see the Bayesian playlist for information on Bayes' theorem. It's also important to mention a few points that we have not talked about. First, Although we've given the rough picture of how to obtain the parameter values that minimize the chi-squared, 
we haven't said anything about the uncertainties on those resulting values. And second, we haven't said anything about evaluating whether or not the fit parameters we extract actually do describe the data very well. For example, in our scenario, we assumed the object was released at rest at location y equals 0. We therefore used the relation y of t equals 1 half gt squared in our analysis. But what if the initial location or velocity were distinctly different from 0? Then the data may not be well described by the relation y of t equals 1 half gt squared. So how do we determine if the fitted function actually does describe the data well? We'll try to address these questions when we work out specific examples in other videos.